Looks like we've still got people joining, but let's get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Zach Snyder, and you are at Solar Oregon's How to Go Solar and Storage webinar. This is an event that we put on every uh, month, uh, sometimes more than once a month, that is for home and business owners who are interested in learning all about uh, solar and battery storage and the technology, the incentives, and how to get started uh, with the installation. So if that's you, then you're in the right place. Um, we are going to uh, cover a few topics here. Uh, the first is I'm going to show you how the technology works. We're going to talk about net metering. Uh, then we'll take a look at what uh, makes a home or business right for solar. That involves the structure of the building, the roof, uh, the electrical service. Then we'll take a look at battery storage uh, and specifically solar plus storage, which is the combination of solar and a, a home battery or battery for your business, uh, which is a very hot topic. A lot of people are interested in. We've got a lot of content there. Um, we will then talk about the incentives that are available for solar, uh, which are great incentives. Um, and we'll go through an example budget and then we'll end talking about how uh, to get started finding a contractor and uh, what the installation process looks like. We'll finish up with a, a Q&A and I'm happy to make that an extended Q&A. Uh, 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 I love to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, so please, any questions that you have about solar or about the content that I'm delivering today um, or about battery storage, uh, feel free to uh, submit those in the Q&A, which I'll show you here in just a second. Uh, this is all content that we update relatively frequently, and so uh, glad to have just performed a, a big annual update in December, uh, and we have a lot of new content. So if you've joined previously uh, last year or previous year, um, things are a little bit up to date now. A um, little bit about Solar Oregon. We're a 43-year-old nonprofit, and we work to... Uh, advance the adoption of solar and related technologies through education, outreach, uh, community building, and advocacy. We do that uh, in a number of ways, one of which is our How to Go Solar and Storage uh, program, which is uh, what you're at right now. We also host solar tours, uh, showcase events, uh, both in person and virtually. Uh, we help to put on community scale campaigns called Solarize campaigns. We had one uh, last year in Hood River County, and we're expecting to do another one this year. Um, and uh, we tell a lot of stories about uh, about solar and, um, and try to facilitate education as much as possible uh, through community networks. We've got a few upcoming events that I wanna mention real quick. One of them is tomorrow. Uh, March 23rd at 6 p.m. This is going to be a an, uh, kind of an open house home showcase of a very exciting uh, new technology called a smart electrical panel. And so if you think of your breaker box in your garage, this is essentially the smart home version of that. Uh, and it allows uh, really uh, an incredible amount of control and visibility into how you're using energy. And it has some implications for folks who own batteries and solar as well. Um, and so I uh, encourage you, that's gonna be in uh, Northeast Portland uh, around, I believe 29th street. Uh, there's a free registration uh, and the address is, will be emailed to you once you register. Uh, you can find that all on our uh, website, solaroregon.org, or if you search on Eventbrite, Solar Oregon. We also have a series of events that's put on by some of our dedicated uh, board members and volunteers called the Green Energy Series, uh, covering more technical topics in depth. And uh, it's been a lot of fun so far. It started off at the last uh, part of last year. Um, our One of our board members, Edward Louie, who's a energy efficiency researcher at the Pacific Northwest National Lab, is going to be talking about inverter and battery choices. And uh, this is the first Saturdays and it's at 10 a.m. So the next one is April 1st. And you can also find that on our uh, website. Uh, just a quick mention, thank you to anybody who's joining who's a member of Solar Oregon. 
Uh, we appreciate having you and your support uh, for what we do. Uh, and if you're not a member, please consider becoming a member. It's an awesome way to support us. Um, and uh, you can find more information, uh, some links that I just dropped in the chat. Uh, I'm going to refer uh, to those links throughout the webinar. Um, so uh, take a look at them. It includes links uh, with information uh, about incentives as well. Finally, uh, thank you to Energy Trust of Oregon. They are an independent nonprofit that uh, provides a lot of uh, incentives and uh, uh, also supports educational programming like this How to Go Solar program and other programming that Solar Oregon puts on. Uh, and they serve the customers of Portland General Electric, Pacific Power, and the gas utilities, uh, which is most of the ratepayers across the state. Uh, helping to uh, increase access to affordable energy and renewable energy. So thank you to Energy Trust for their support. And a little housekeeping note here. Um, we have a chat, and that's where I've dropped the links for this webinar. Uh, so go ahead and make sure you open up that and take a look. Also, the uh, Q&A box is a separate function here. So if you mouse over your screen, you'll see your menu on Zoom and you'll see a button that says q and A. If you click that button, a little window will open and you can type in your text of your question. Please feel free to, to do that. You can start doing that now if you already have questions lined up uh, about solar. I'm gonna wait till the end of the webinar to answer those, uh, but that is uh, how we're gonna do questions in the webinar. Um, and finally, I've got some polls, <laughs> excuse me, uh, which are a way for me to understand who I'm talking to right now uh, and to get to know you. So the first one here, you should see a little box popped up on your screen asking where you're joining from. Uh, and uh, I'll just give a couple seconds here. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll out. Thank you so much. Uh, the next poll that I would like to share, uh, this is a, uh, a voluntary uh, demographics uh, uh, report and it's something that we use for our reporting for our funding. Uh, it's appreciated and it's optional and anonymous. So I'll just give a, a minute here, leave that up on the screen. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and give just a couple seconds and then I'll close this one out too. Uh, and the last poll that I have at the beginning of the webinar here is asking about your familiarity with a couple of incentives uh, from Energy Trust of Oregon. One of them, the first one is asking, yes or no, are you familiar with their standard solar incentive? The second one is asking whether you are familiar with their solar within reach incentive. Feel free to click no or not sure if you just haven't heard of those. And I'll give just a few more seconds here. All right, thank you so much. Let's go ahead and dive into it. So we are first going to talk about the technology of uh, that is put into a solar system, how it all works together. Um, this is a relatively simple diagram of a solar system. You can see there's just a few components here. So let's start up at what is labeled photovoltaic panel. That is a solar panel. You can see the little solar cells on there. Uh, that obviously is not going to be floating in the air. It's going to be on your roof or mounted on a ground mount. The sunlight strikes the solar panel that produces electricity, and it really is uh, pretty much that simple. It's a type of electricity, however, called DC electricity. 
And uh, that is in contrast to what's called AC electricity, which is what your home and all the circuits in your home uh, use. And so there is an extra piece of electrical equipment here called the inverter. Uh, sometimes there are several micro inverters. They both do the same thing though. They just make that conversion from DC electricity to AC electricity. From there, the solar electricity flows through a wire that's uh, wired into your home electrical panel. That's your breaker box. And from there, it goes to power all of these circuits in your home, including your lights, your appliances. If you have an electric vehicle, it goes to charge that as well. Uh, and if you are producing more solar at any given moment than you are consuming, the excess electricity is going to flow back out through your utility meter and onto the utility grid. When you are consuming more than you're producing, for example, at night, uh, the grid is still there. You're still tied to the grid uh, and you are able to purchase electricity which will flow in from uh, the grid through your utility meter uh, and power the circuits in your home. And uh, so the fact that this is a such a simple system uh, is one of the great benefits of solar. It's something that requires uh, very little maintenance compared to other forms of energy generation, uh, including a, a home generator, uh, and uh, that's an overview of a system. Let's take a look at a couple of these components. So uh, I want to give you a look at the inverters and microinverters. And on the left, we have an image of an inverter. This is mounted on the outside of the home in this image. However, the inverter also is very commonly uh, installed next to your electrical panel, which is usually in your garage. And that's actually the best place for it. Uh, though, uh, if you don't have space there, it's just fine to install it on the outside of the home. Uh, the white box here is the inverter itself. You can see the little conduit run going up to the solar system on the roof. And then there's uh, a little um, AC disconnect, which is the little electrical box right next to the inverter. Um, the uh, image on the right is an image that is uh, looking up underneath a solar array that's mounted on the ground, which may or may not be your situation, likely won't be. But the reason we're looking at this uh, from below is to see these little black boxes. Those are the microinverters, and there's usually a microinverter for every one or two solar panels. They do the exact same thing as inverters. So you might be asking yourself a question, why would you choose inverters or microinverters? And uh, that boils down to uh, how your contractor is going to design your system uh, based on the system size and some other factors. One might be a little bit more economical or advantageous uh, for uh, some other reason. And uh, your installer is going to be great at making those kinds of decisions. So you don't have to worry about making that decision yourself. Just know that these are things that you might see in your system design. Uh, now, solar can be mounted in a couple of ways. The most common way in which solar is mounted is on the roof. And that's great because your sun, your roof is just sitting, uh, baking in the sunshine. And uh, why not use that energy and that space to produce electricity for you? Uh, that's especially used in urban environments. Uh, there is an option also to mount solar on what's called a ground mount. And that is... Uh, not very common uh, in most places anyway. Uh, however, uh, you only really have the space for it when you've got, uh, you're a little bit outside of an urban center, typically. You do have to dedicate some land area to the solar system. Uh, and ground mounts can be really great for some people. Uh, do note that if you have a space for a ground mount and you're considering that, uh, you also have to trench a wire from the system back to your electrical panel. And if the ground mount is far away from your home, that can add some cost, uh, sometimes significant cost to your system. Just one of the trade-offs of having a ground mount, but these are both great systems. I wanna take uh, one slide and make a detour into something which is a bit of a niche technology called solar roof tiles. This is something that accounts for, relatively speaking, a minuscule portion of the solar market in Oregon. Uh, there are a couple of dozen likely homes that have solar roof tiles installed. Uh, you can see on the image on uh, the left here, there are no solar panels on this roof. However, the roof is still producing electricity 
And that's because the roof tiles, the shingles themselves are producing that electricity. It's not all of the shingles in the roof. It's just a portion of them. Um, the other ones are, uh, they look exactly the same. So you can't tell which part of the roof is generating electricity. This is something we get a lot of questions about because there have been uh, marketing uh, campaigns uh, by prominent companies about solar roof tiles. Uh, it is interesting. Uh, one thing to note is that it's relatively speaking a more complex technology overall than standard solar panels. And what part of that, uh, what that means is that the technology is just more expensive. And it also means that the installation period can be quite a bit longer than a standard uh, solar installation. Uh, another aspect of this is that when you call up a solar installer, nine out of 10 solar installers uh, are going to have a zero ability to install solar roof tiles. They might be able to point you to a company that can. There are multiple manufacturers, and typically it's the manufacturer themselves or a certified installer of their product. Uh, that will actually be able to do that installation for you. I would recommend if you are interested in this technology, which again is going to be a, a, the vast minority of people, uh, that you look for a team that has experience with it. Uh, because it's so new, there aren't a whole lot of teams that have experience, and I think that that experience is very valuable. Uh, and again, there are uh, promises sometimes by the in industry about uh, price declines that you might expect in the near future. However, those have not materialized in the past. It's not that they won't materialize in the future, but uh, my last note here is that the price declines in the industry are unpredictable. And so if you're thinking about solar, uh, you know the, there are also changing uh, incentives uh, in the landscape at times. And it's just typically better not to wait if you're considering solar. Uh, now back talking about uh, our typical solar system or about any solar system, including solar roof tiles. Uh, let's go over net metering. So I mentioned that when your system is producing more electricity than you're using at any given moment, the excess can be exported to the grid and you actually will get a credit for that uh, using this net metering system. You'll get what's called a net metering credit. Uh, when you are uh, needing electricity from the grid, you can still purchase that. So I'm going to describe this and uh, in the by describing a typical summer month, which is where it's going to be very sunny and you're going to be producing a lot of energy, and a typical winter month. And the graphs here, the orange bar, is the amount of electricity your solar system is producing in the course of that typical sunny summer month on the left graph. The blue bar is the amount of electricity that you, say, consumed that month. The green arrow then is going to be that difference. And so you'll see that you have a surplus of energy produced by your solar system. And that's going to correspond to your net metering credit earned. Let's fast forward to a cloudy winter month, especially in the Willamette Valley, that uh, where you are going to be producing less energy with your solar system. Uh, and say you're still consuming a similar amount of energy, there's going to be this difference. And that's how much you're going to purchase from the grid. However, because you built up these net metering credits during the sunny summer months, you can use those credits to offset uh, these units of electricity that you would be purchasing. It's a great system. It's something that uh, is available in the large Pacific Power and PGE utilities. There are also uh, consumer uh, co-op utilities uh, and PUDs, et cetera, that have net metering policies. However, some of those smaller rural uh, utilities do not have net metering policies or have net metering policies that are a little bit different or a little bit uh, less advantageous. So if you are in a rural area, you should check with your utility company. However, a solar installer in your area will also be able to check for you and is probably very familiar with your utility anyway. Uh, one thing to note about net metering is that the net metering calendar year starts in April. Uh, on April 1st, and it goes through March 31st. And the credits, although they roll over from month to month, they do not roll over from year to year. What this means is that you'll want to have a system that meets but does not exceed your electricity needs. Because uh, if you have a system that's too large, you'll end up with a lot of credits that you're forfeiting at the end of the year. Uh, and so I'll talk about that more in just a couple slides. But that's net metering. 
Here's an example of a net metering bill uh, from a, a customer of PGE. And uh, you can see over here on the left that the uh, uh, meter, which by the way, you get swapped out uh, your regular meter for what's called a bi-directional meter uh, when you get solar. And that reads the electricity coming into the home and as well as the electricity going out. So you can see this net consumption meter, that's the electricity you're buying. Excess generation, that's the electricity going out. There's a little bit of addition and subtraction here. And uh, this person during this month, uh, in September to October, gained 327 kilowatt hours of net metering credit. That's their net metering credit earned. You can see that uh, this month they'll have zero billable kilowatt hours of electricity. The And then below here, it'll show how much net metering credit they have overall uh, saved up throughout the year. The uh, uh, on the right, you might be surprised to note that they still are going to pay $12.63. However, the uh, that's something that anybody who's connected to the utility grid is going to pay. Uh, that $11 is for uh, just being connected. That's your basic service charge. And you can think of that as money that goes to paying for maintaining the grid uh, and sending out the teams to go fix a power line when a tree branch falls on it, for example. The uh, $1.40 in taxes and fees you can see are uh, come from different sources, uh, but it's a relatively small number of fees there. Uh, you can see that that uh, it's a relatively inexpensive utility bill. You likely are paying somewhere between $70 and $120 in your utility bill. And so the difference here can be uh, substantial. And that's something that uh, will be every single month that you have your solar system, uh, as long as you have a net metering uh, a system and you're able to take advantage of the credits that you export. Uh, and so this is a great way to uh, build wealth uh, over time. Your system does pay for itself. And beyond that point, uh, your system is saving you money on your utility bills every month. Now about system size, I mentioned that uh, because of net metering and the fact that credits don't roll over from year to year, you want to size your system so it meets but does not exceed your needs, uh, your uh, your consumption needs. Your installation company is going to be really good at making that uh, that estimation. They will ask for your past utility bills, and uh, if you are planning on getting uh, new electric appliances or having uh, an electric vehicle charger in the future, or if you're planning on having other people move in and you're having your uh, electrical usage go up, uh, any changes that you expect, or if you're having people move out, say a child that's going uh, off to college, uh, and you expect significant changes in your consumption, mention that to your contractor, they're going to factor that into your uh, estimation of, of how much uh, electricity you're going to consume over the course of a typical year, and that will affect the size of your system that they will recommend to you. Uh, a number of people can offset 100% of their electricity consumption just with a rooftop solar system, uh, which is really great. However, not everybody can, and that's totally fine. If you are able to offset uh, just a third of your electricity consumption, uh, solar can still be a great investment uh, and has a similar uh, return on investment in terms of uh, payback period and everything like that. The other factors that can affect your system size are the amount of roof space you have relative to the amount of electricity you consume. Uh, you also might be constrained by your budget. Say you want to install a portion of uh, your roof with solar uh, and uh, uh, you know maybe later even consider adding more solar panels on. You'll definitely want to mention that to your installer. Uh, because they're going to select in your inverter and other components and size it so that it can uh, handle exactly the amount of solar that you're intending to have. Um, but uh, you can do that, and there are people who who add on to their solar system later on. The typical size of a solar system, uh, the size of a solar system is measured in something called KW, that's kilowatts. And you don't have to worry about what that means, uh, but I am going to tell you that the average size system in Oregon is roughly eight kilowatts. And uh, that's going to be important later when I show you an example solar budget.
That's an overview of how solar and net metering work. Let's dive now into what makes it easy or more difficult and potentially more expensive to install solar on a home. The first thing I wanna talk about is your solar access. That's how much solar resource you have that you can tap into on your property. Uh, here is a hypothetical home with a hypothetical solar system on it. On top of the compass rows and these arcs over the home with the orange beach balls on them, that's the path of the sun in the sky. Uh, of course, the sun rises in the east, and because we're in the northern hemisphere, it travel travels in the southern uh, sky to the west where it sets. And the fact that it travels in the southern sky means that south-facing roofs are going to be ideal for solar. However, east-facing roofs, west-facing roofs, everywhere from pretty much uh, east-southeast to due west is perfect for solar. You can sometimes get away with solar on the east side of the roof, especially if you're east of the Cascades. That's mostly due to the fact that we have uh, typically mistier mornings than uh, relative compared to with uh, our afternoons, which are, happen to be sunnier. Um, the only portions of your roof on which you consistently don't see solar being installed are on the north, uh, basically northwest to uh, east northeast. However, you could have a perfect south facing roof and you could be thwarted by beautiful shade throwing objects like trees or less beautiful shade throwing objects like buildings. Uh, you should be thankful that you get some shade that does uh, give you some relief on your utility bill anyway, uh, because it will cool you in the summer uh, and you can avoid some of those cooling costs potentially. It can be hard to tell whether a tree on your property or your neighbor's property is going to actually uh, throw shade during that critical peak sun uh, portion of the day and prevent you from having a productive solar system. Uh, unless you are just really good with cardinal directions, um, uh, sometimes it's hard to get a sense. Solar contractors are really good at doing that. They'll get on Google Maps and get a good sense, at least I would say a 70% sense of whether solar is gonna be viable on your product. If, uh, if they have any concerns about shade throwing objects, they'll actually come to your home, get up on the roof and use a little device to uh, record how much sun each part of your roof is going to get throughout the day. And that's going to go into uh, designing a system with a really precise estimate of how much energy it's going to produce. Another aspect, there are several aspects of your roof that are going to determine whether it's easy or difficult to go solar. One of them is the geometry of your roof. So I'm talking here about roof complexity. And these are a couple of Google uh, maps, images of homes in the Willamette Valley. You can see uh, that the home on the left I characterize as complex. You can see it's broken up into multiple geometric planes that are a little bit funky uh, and have uh, acute angles on them. That's going to make it difficult to install solar on the vast majority of these roof planes. You may be able to put solar on a couple of these roof planes, but it's not going to be a very large system, even though, relatively speaking, this is a somewhat large roof. Uh, contrast that with the simple roof on the right-hand image, and you can see it's a perfect south-facing roof, lots of roof space. Most of the vents are on the north face of the roof, and so that's not going to obstruct the solar panels. All you have is that one dormer over the garage, uh, which probably will not be installed on, uh, but there, there's still plenty of roof space here for a great solar system. The next aspect of your roof, and probably the most important one, is your roof's condition and age. This is important because when you have to re-roof, you can't really postpone that. And when you re-roof, you're going to have to uninstall your solar system, perform the re-roofing, and then reinstall your solar system. Your solar company can likely provide that service for you. Uh, sometimes there, there can be a couple month wait, so you do have to coordinate with your solar system to uh, get them scheduled to come and perform that uninstall, reinstall job. Uh, and the, the job itself can cost uh, upwards sometimes of even $10,000. And so it's something that you really want to have happen at the end of the life cycle of your solar panels 
And then if you go solar again, after you get a new roof, uh, after the lifetime of the roof, uh, then you can just buy a new solar system. Uh, and there's some advantages to that as well. Uh, so for this reason, it's recommended that you have uh, ideally 20 plus years of roof life left. That is quite a bit to ask. Uh, in a lot of cases, a lot of people are in the uh, five to 10 year range for a roof. If you have less than 10 years of li life left on your roof, uh, I would suggest that you wait to go solar until you re-roof. When you re-roof, that's the perfect time to go solar uh, because then your roof life cycle is going to match up with your solar life cycle uh, and you're going to gain the maximum benefit with the least lifetime cost of that system. Finally, what is underneath the roof uh, also is important. And here I'm talking about the difference between specifically trusses and rafters. This is primarily important in Portland and it's Portland, uh, important in the context of structural permits for your system, which your installer is gonna be applying for. Portland is in Oregon, the jurisdiction that is most picky about its structural requirements. It has a lot of local structural requirements that are not uh, applicable in other jurisdictions in the state, uh, which is great if you're outside of Portland. Uh, and this, the issues that come up here are mostly with older homes and mostly specifically with urban craftsman homes uh, in the Portland area. Uh, so if it's a newer home, most likely you're going to look up in your attic and see these support beams, both, both uh, vertically and horizontally. That means that you have trusses. Here you can see these metal plates at the junction between the support beams and uh, the main beams. And uh, that tells you that you have prefabricated trusses. You're going to be just fine. You're going to sail through any structural permitting process. If you have rafters in your attic, and that's where you don't have these support beams, it's just the uh, beam uh, from eave to crest that runs along the roof, uh, you could be... Uh, have no issues at all with your permitting, even in Portland, especially with newer homes. Where this, uh, where people experience an issue is where the uh, the span of the roof, so say your roof is just really wide and has a wide span, uh, there are certain measurement requirements uh, that allow you, if the span is short enough, uh, that you don't have to worry about uh, having to go through any extra procedure. However, if your, if your raptors span too far, your installation company is going to have to hire an engineer to run some calculations to make sure that your rafters are uh, structurally suitable for solar. And the engineer will either come back and say, yep, the calculations pass and you get your permit. Uh, the engineer could also come back and say that you need to install some structural reinforcements, which is something that your solar contractor will be able to do for you as long as there's space to get up in your attic and maneuver in there and actually uh, make that installation happen. Uh, the engineering costs can be somewhere between two and three thousand dollars, and the structural reinforcement costs can be anywhere from three to an additional seven thousand uh, dollars. So uh, it does matter. It matters particularly in Portland again for older urban craftsman homes uh, specifically, um, but uh, but also uh, is not an issue for most people in the state. So that's an overview of some site characteristics uh, that could determine how easy and expensive it is for you to go solar. Let's take a look now at an exciting topic, which is solar plus battery storage. And the reason we're talking about this is because power outages happen. The grid does go down sometimes, and it goes down sometimes more frequently in, uh, in some places than it does in other places. You probably know if you're in a place where you experience frequent outages, uh, solar and storage is a solution that can help you keep your lights on and uh, gain access to power during uh, a certain period of time during an outage, maybe allowing you to weather most uh, frequent outages. We are talking here, just to give you a visual example about solar panels on the rooftop and a battery here on the left in the garage. So uh, when we think about uh, power outages, there are a few different flavors. And the one that you're preparing for is going to impact how your installer might design a system for you. 
The most frequent outages are caused by storms and squirrels. Uh, those happen more frequently toward the end of the line. That's in more rural areas, typically. Uh, again, you'll know if you have those types of outages and they're relatively uh, consistent in their frequency. The, another type of power of uh, power outage is called a public safety power shutoff. And this is specifically uh, to prevent wildfires. The utility company will turn off part of the uh, their uh, transmission and distribution system in a portion of their grid. Uh, and that's to prevent their wires that run through the forest from sparking a fire uh, during hot and dry and windy conditions, essentially red flag conditions. The first public safety power shutoff happened in 2020 in Oregon. Uh, there have been other public safety power shutoffs. There were a number this past year, uh, last summer, uh, in a, a number of places, including, uh, I think, the uh, Salem, east of Salem area, uh, even around uh, the Portland metro area on, in the West Hills. Um, they are constrained to specific areas of the grid. However, it's not entirely clear uh, where there might be public safety power shutoffs and where there won't. Uh, Hood River County is one place that's been identified as a place where uh, you can expect them more frequently in the future. Um, but uh, typically dense urban centers will not experience those. Uh, and finally, we live in the Cascadia seismic zone. There will be the big earthquake. It's going to be a 9.0. And it's thought that power infrastructure may go down for up to six weeks in the Willamette Valley area for a couple of months out on the coast uh, and also may disrupt some power uh, e even in central Oregon. Uh, obviously, that's a much different type of power outage. And if you are planning for the Cascadia seismic zone, and that's the reason you're considering a battery, you'll definitely want to mention that to your contractor because uh, planning for a six-week outage is not typically feasible with a home uh, battery system. However, uh, you can explore what options uh, you can weave into your system to make it meet your needs as well as possible. Now, when it comes to picking a battery, uh, there are many, many batteries on the market to choose from. Don't be thinking that there's just uh, one uh, battery uh, to choose from. There are also a couple of different chemistries. Uh, all residential grid tied batteries are pretty much lithium ion batteries these days, uh, which are great batteries. Uh, there, are, that's lithium ion is more of a family of chemistries. Uh, there's uh, nickel manganese cobalt, which is a, a great battery, uh, works well. Uh, there's also lithium iron phosphate, and uh, that is a little bit more expensive. Uh, however, it does have a, a longer lifetime uh, overall for the battery system. Note that if you are wanting to compare different batteries and different makes of batteries, uh, you will have to uh, consider multiple installers most likely, and that's because most installers will specialize in one or maybe a couple of brands of batteries uh, and focus on installing those. However, I would recommend getting multiple quotes regardless for your excuse me, for your solar system. Uh, you cannot mix and match battery components uh, between brands. You can't have this battery from this company and this battery from another company. However, you can uh, mix and match uh, batteries between a single company. And also you can mix and match solar panel companies with battery companies, uh, no problem. Finally, if you have a lot of appliances or some appliances uh, uh, that draw a lot of instantaneous power, so specifically motors, where they require a large uh, volume of current right as they start up, and it's just for sometimes a fraction of a second or a second, uh, you are going to potentially need a battery that uh, specifically can deliver more current. And so you'll want to mention that to your contractor as well. Uh, when you install a battery, one battery cannot typically back up a whole home and all the circuits in it for a meaningful amount of time. And for that reason, the vast majority of battery installations for residential grid tied systems are what we call a partial home backup. And what your contractor is going to do is they're going to spend a lot of time talking to you about uh, what circuits do you want to back up? How uh, do you use energy on those circuits? What are the appliances? Uh, how you know energy expensive are those appliances? 
Uh, you're going to select specific breakers in your existing breaker panel. Your contractor is going to move those over to a new electrical panel called an essential loads panel and back that electric panel <laughs> and that subset of your breakers up with the battery uh, directly. The rest of your electrical panel and the breakers in it are going to lose power when there's an outage still. You can get a whole home backup if you invest in multiple batteries. Sometimes it takes two batteries. Sometimes if you use a lot of energy, you can take three batteries. There are uh, folks who like to install uh, four batteries that I've, I've seen those uh, installations as large as, as that uh, in residential situations. Um, and uh, sometimes that can even cover uh, a relatively high amount of consumption for a reasonable amount of time. Uh, including, say, an EV charger. Here's what uh, an essential loads panel uh, looks like. Uh, again, this is for if you have a partial home backup. Now, when you get, uh, when you tell your, your contractor that you would like a battery with your solar system, you're going to be essentially balancing these two questions. What needs power and for how long? Uh, the system will have a nominal period of autonomy, and that's the amount of time over which you can expect your battery to power the circuits that it's connected to, given your typical usage of those circuits and how the system was designed. Uh, if uh, a, In a typical situation, uh, folks like to back up their refrigerator to keep food from spoiling, some lights, maybe in a bedroom and some common areas, and say some outlets for charging cell phones, computers, so that you can communicate and work. If you wanna add uh, additional circuits on there, say for a television or for uh, an electric water heater, uh, that can decrease the period of autonomy, the length of time over which your battery is going to meet those needs uh, and which, on, over which you can rely on your battery meeting those needs. Uh, so just know that it's going to be a bit of a conversation and your contractor is going to do some calculations uh, and there's going to be some effort put into making sure that your system is tailored to your needs. Uh, one of the great things, one of the best things about solar and battery storage is that this is a highly customizable technology. And what that means is when your installer is designing your system, they're going to select the components uh, in a way that they work as well together as possible and meet your needs uh, as well as possible without having you buy something and pay for something that you don't need and that you're not going to actually use. Uh, what the flip side of that is, however, is that uh, when the system is designed and installed, uh, then all of that uh, customize, customization potential uh, gets solidified in your system. And adding on to a system and augmenting a system can be a little bit more expensive and a little bit less efficient than had you incorporated those uh, augmentations in the initial system design. Now, this is important in the uh, context of the question of when you want to install your battery storage. And there's a couple of ways in which you might be coming at this. You might be someone who's uh, considering a solar and battery storage system and wondering if you can uh, chunk out the project so that you can uh, you know, pay for a certain portion of it now and then install uh, a battery later or install another component later, more solar panels. You're definitely going to want to let your contractor know if that's the case. Uh, and it's possible that they could design you a system uh, which will make it so you can easily add on those new components. Uh, however, uh, if you don't mention that to your contractor, if they're not able to do that for you, then uh, there can be additional cost when you add a battery after you uh, make your initial solar installation. Uh, you might also be coming at this as someone who has an existing solar installation, wondering if you can add a battery to your existing system. The answer is yes. Uh, it, it will not be as uh, economically efficient uh, as had you installed that battery at the same time as your initial solar system. Uh, there may be an extra overall $10,000 of cost. However, <laughs> uh, rest assured that you can add a battery uh, to an existing solar system. Uh, and finally here, uh, batteries do require space. All of these components require space. The system pictured here 
and the system system pictured in the last slide are large battery systems. Uh, and so you'll see there are there are multiple inverters. There's also four batteries in this image. This is a very expansive system. However, uh, there's a lot of wall space taken up here. Uh, even if you have a modest system with a single battery and a single solar inverter, there's going to be some space that you're going to need. And ideally, again, that's going to be in your garage next to your uh, main breaker panel. Note that you cannot put a battery or a solar inverter in a crawl space or a cupboard or another enclosed space like that. You can install these components outside. However, there are other advantages uh, to installing uh, them uh, inside. Uh, sometimes that just has to do with temperature regulation for the battery. Um, however, a lot of them are built to be installed outside as well. Uh, the code governing this is the National Electric Code. Uh, it's there to keep you safe and make sure that your system is uh, performing highly and meeting all your needs. Uh, so uh, all of these rules are there for very good reason. So that's an overview of solar plus storage. Let's take a look now at the incentives available and an example budget for solar and for solar plus storage. So the incentives that most people are going to be able to take advantage of in the state of Oregon uh, include the federal, uh, there's the solar investment tax credit. That's a 30% dollar for dollar tax credit, uh, which is a great incentive. That's obviously a very large incentive. Uh, and that was just renewed in uh, last year's legislation at the federal level. And that's going to be around for a number of years now. Uh, additionally, uh, Energy Trust of Oregon offers solar incentives. And one of them is their standard solar incentive. Uh, which is available to customers of Pacific Power and Portland General Electric, the two large investor-owned utilities, which is most rate payers in the state. However, if you have a small rural electric co-op or a municipal uh, a, a utility, you will not be able to take advantage of the Energy Trust of Oregon incentives. Uh, the standard incentive is a flat $500 uh, for, excuse me, uh, I think it's, yeah, $500 uh, for the um, uh, uh, both uh, PGE and Pacific Power customers. So here's a, a little bit more information about the investment tax credit. Uh, again, 30% of the system cost uh, that uh, essentially uh, is something uh, that comes off of your tax bill. This is the only incentive that I'm going to mention that uh, you'll have access to that is something that you're going to have to apply for. Uh, you do that when you file your, file your taxes. However, this is governed by uh, tax law. And so you are liable for how you uh, apply for this incentive. And for that reason, uh, I strongly suggest that you only uh, trust guidance on the investment tax credit from uh, solar tax professionals or tax professionals in general. Um, there are uh, tax professionals out there and ones with solar expertise. Uh, and uh, the vast majority of people, uh, this is going to be a relatively straightforward application. Uh, and uh, and there's really not much to worry about. It's, but if you have questions, just ask a professional. Solar Oregon is not a tax professional. So please take everything I say here as um, unofficial guidance. The tax credit applies to both solar and battery storage, which is great news. That's an update from uh, 20, uh, before 2022, uh, before it was just solar. Uh, this can be claimed over several years. And so if you don't have the tax liability in the first year, uh, you can apply over several years. However, you can't, if say you have a tax bill of $5,000 and you have a tax credit for your system of $9,000, uh, you can't get a $4,000 surplus check sent to you. Uh, that's not how the credit works, uh, but you can roll over the credit to the next year. Uh, this is applied for using IRS forms 5695, as well as form uh, 1040 schedule three. There's a piece of information you have to put on that form as well. <coughs> we are going to have a uh, an Earth Day special webinar with a tax professional. Uh, Elizabeth Krauss from KNL Gates, who is a solar uh, tax expert. Uh, and we're going to be taking a deep dive into the investment tax credit 
if you have questions, that's maybe a good opportunity to uh, ask them at the Q&A at our webinar uh, and get to know Elizabeth. Uh, she's been great. She's been uh, donating her services to help us uh, make sure that we are providing accurate information about this. Uh, I want to also mention Solar Within Reach, which is an additional incentive from Energy Trust of Oregon, and it's one of two incentives that are available in the state uh, for income qualified solar homeowners. Uh, what that means is that if you are below a, a certain threshold of income, you can take advantage of these incentives, uh, and they're relatively significant. The Solar Within Reach incentive is up to $6,000 for Pacific Power customers, up to $7,200 for PGE customers. Uh, additionally, uh, the, the income threshold here, uh, to, just to give you an example, for a household of four uh, is $112,860. That's for the cumulative household income. Uh, it's a relatively generous income threshold, and so a number of people are going to be able to take advantage of that. Uh, you can find more information about Solar Within Reach in the links that I uh, put in the chat at the beginning of the webinar, and you'll see the Energy Trust uh, excuse me, the solar within reach incentive link there. And you'll be able to find a chart and see the income threshold for your household size. Uh, an additional income-based incentive is the solar plus storage rebate uh, provided by the state. This is available to anybody in the state, even uh, members of a, an electric co-op, a rural co-op or a municipal utility. This is up to $5,000 for solar and up to $2,500 for storage, and you're probably going to max those out uh, if you meet the income thresholds. Um, these are different income thresholds, so you may qualify for solar within reach from Energy Trust of Oregon, but not for the solar plus storage rebate, so do keep that in mind. Uh, your installer is going to help you uh, navigate all of these incentives. So I'm going to show you an example budget of a solar system, as well as a solar plus storage system. Before I do that, I just want to recap some of the reasons why solar costs vary, because uh, there is some danger in uh, showing an example budget for a solar system, uh, because these systems can range in price dramatically. One thing is certain, the budget that I will show you is not going to be what your system is going to cost. However, uh, it is hopefully going to give you a general sense of how much a system could cost. <clears throat> the uh, probably the biggest factor for uh, determining how, why solar uh, uh, may vary in cost is the size of the system. Solar is incredibly versatile, and so you can have very small systems and very large systems. So if you have a large system, there's going to be some extra cost there. If you need to re-roof, that's going to be a large extra cost that you may as well consider part of your uh, solar system if that's the reason why you're re-roofing. But again, uh, typically folks need to re-roof anyway when they need to re-roof. And so uh, that's uh, just something that you have to do. There may be a cost associated with these structural analysis and upgrade, and your access to incentives may also vary based on your utility and your income. Same with storage. Uh, prices can vary based on how many batteries you install, whether those batteries are installed uh, to an existing system, increasing the cost, or whether they're incorporated in a new system design, uh, making it more efficient. Uh, the uh, distance from the electric panel uh, can increase the, the cost of a storage system due to a little bit extra uh, electrician labor uh, and having to run some more conduit around the house. And uh, of course, access to incentives, including the solar plus storage incentive from the state uh, can affect how much a battery system costs for you. This is our first example budget. This is for a solar system uh, that is an eight kilowatt solar system. Again, that's the average size of a solar system in Oregon. And we're making a lot of assumptions here. This is not something where there is structural cost, where there's a lot of extra uh, cost in any dimension. Uh, the cost for the system uh, before incent, well, first, uh, the there are four columns here, price columns. Uh, you can see that the left two columns are for the main two utilities, Pacific Power and Portland General Electric. And these are for non-income qualifying folks. Those folks will not receive the solar within reach or the state 
solar plus storage uh, income-based incentives. The right two columns are for the same utilities, Pacific Power and Portland General Electric, uh, but uh, it is for homeowners who do qualify for both of those incentives. So the cost before incentives is going to be roughly, <clears throat> roughly $32,000, which is a reasonable cost estimate for a simple uh, system that is eight kilowatts and just solar. We apply the energy trust incentives and the uh, state rebate. Your contractor is going to apply for and receive and pass on to you the money for those incentives. And so you're not going to have to lift a finger there, which is great news. <laughs> Excuse me. You can see that uh, due to the larger income-based incentives, uh, the out-of-pocket cost that you will pay for the system uh, is, if you are not income qualified, is roughly $31,500, which is roughly the same system cost minus that $500 incentive from Energy Trust. Uh, or if you are uh, someone who has access to these income-based incentives, uh, that's going to be about $10,000 knocked off of that incentive, maybe a little bit more, or sorry, off of that system cost. That is what you'll pay out of pocket. That's what you'll see as uh, what is due to your solar contractor. Uh, the federal tax credit is a great incentive. It's a large incentive. Again, you're going to apply for that uh, on the taxes for the year in which the system installation was completed. That means that if you uh, hire a solar contractor in December and they install it in January, February, March, uh, the... <laughs> Uh, you will apply the following year on, on your taxes for this incentive. So just know that there is a little bit of lag time there. However, that brings the final uh, uh, net cost of the construction of your system to roughly $22,000 in this case, if you are not income qualified, or roughly $14,000 if you are. So you can see the incentives make a huge impact potentially on the cost of your system. Uh, however, there is still, of course, some upfront cost there. Let's take a look at a similar budget, but for a 8 kilowatt solar system with an additional 10 kilowatt hour battery installed at the same time. The uh, cost before incentives, uh, we're going to estimate at about $44,000. Uh, we're going to apply these incentives, which again, your installer is going to uh, apply for and receive on your behalf. Uh, and this is going to take it down to roughly, uh, again, still about $44,000 for uh, non-income qualified folks. For income qualified folks, it's going to take it down to about $30,000 out of pocket. After the federal tax credit, that's going to take this down to about $30,000 for folks who uh, don't have access to the income qualified incentives or about $20,000 for folks who do. Uh, let's take a look now at adding a battery to an existing solar system. And we're going to consider both the installation cost of the solar and the installation cost of the battery. Same 8 kilowatt solar uh, system and 10 kilowatt hour battery system. The uh, total cost of the solar is going to be 32000 plus adding the battery afterwards is going to add extra labor and expense. And it's going to come to about $23,000 uh, for that installation. Uh, we apply these incentives and we're going to uh, reach the out-of-pocket cost, roughly $54,000. So that's about $10,000 more than we saw if the battery is installed at the same time. Um, or if you're income-based, it's going to be roughly $42,000, $43,000. The federal tax credit is going to be applied here. And then the net uh, construction cost is going to come down to roughly $38,000 here for non-income qualified folks or roughly 30,000 for income qualified folks. Again, please take these budgets with a huge grain of salt and uh, note that your system is certainly not going to cost as much as what is shown in these budgets because there's so much variability. Uh, but hopefully this is useful information that gives you a sense of how much these systems cost. Obviously there is that upfront uh, out-of-pocket cost. And so a lot of folks take advantage of financing there are special uh, financing products that credit unions and third-party brokers offer that are tailored to solar. And typically what that means being tailored to solar is that the product, uh, the loan will be refinanced the following year after you take advantage of that, uh, that tax incentive. And so you'll get a better rate. And uh, in that way, it can be optimized uh, financially for your solar system. 
However, if you have an existing relationship with a bank, say for your mortgage, that can be a great place to look for another financing option. Uh, sometimes it's great to have multiple options. As with any major financial decision, I would suggest reading all the fine print and making sure that you know exactly what you're signing up for. Uh, but uh, financing is a great tool and can allow you to uh, to uh, have a very minimal monthly payment for your system. Finally, let's take a look at how to find a good contractor, uh, how to evaluate them and uh, what the installation process will look like as soon as you're ready to sign a contract. Now, when it comes to selecting contractors, uh, the Energy Trust of Oregon, besides providing solar incentives, besides funding great educational programming like Solar Oregon's programs, offers another tremendous service, which is uh, a certification for solar contractors, and that is uh, solar contractors who are a trade ally of Energy Trust of Oregon. These contractors are rigorously qualified uh, to make sure that they're doing good work and that they have good business practices. And only these contractors will be approved to offer the Energy Trust of Oregon incentives. You'll still have access to the other incentives if you use a non-trade ally contractor. However, if you want to have access, especially to that solar within reach incentive, uh, you are definitely going to need a trade ally contractor. A lot of contractors are trade ally contractors, so you certainly have a, a lot of choices to choose from. Uh, and uh, I would suggest, regardless of where you are in the state, uh, whether or not you're uh, a customer of uh, Portland General Electric or Pacific Power or of a rural electric co-op, uh, you should still consider a trade ally because it's just a great certification. There is an excellent tool that is available to you, and I'm going to put uh, the links back in the chat here because there's a link I'm going to reference. Uh, there is a tool on the Energy Trust of Oregon website called the Solar Bid Tool. And what this tool uh, uh, does is it asks you for your address, for your name, your contact information, and some information about what you're looking for for your system. Uh, it takes about two to five minutes to fill this out. As soon as you fill it out, your uh, information will be, will be passed to three highly rated uh, trade ally contractors who serve your area. They're going to reach out to you within a few days and offer you a free quote. Uh, and so it's a great way to get connected with high quality contractors and to avoid a little bit of the searching uh, for a good contractor. In the chat, you'll see the Energy Trust Dash Solar Bid Tool. Save that link. If you're going to save any link from this uh, webinar, I would definitely save that one because when you're ready to get started looking for a contractor, uh, this is a convenient way to do that. Finally, the installation process. What can you expect? Uh, solar is a turnkey service, meaning that uh, you, when you're, you've done your uh, homework, you've found several contractors, you've gotten quotes, and you've honed in on which company you want to provide your service. Uh, as soon as you sign that contract, uh, there may be a, a portion of your payment that's up front, maybe a portion that is due at the end of the construction. Uh, it, that can vary based on the contractor. Um, however, uh, the contractor, once you sign the contract, is going to handle all aspects of your system design, the permitting, uh, the imply, applying for the incentives, <laughs> excuse me, and, uh, and then doing performing the installation, uh, and managing the inspections, swapping out your bi-directional meter, uh, and uh, interconnecting you to the utility grid. So uh, when you sign the contract, there will be a, a waiting period. Partially that is due to the system design, partially due to the permitting, partially due to applying for incentives. Uh, system design is relatively quick. However, permitting can be a backlog in your area. If there is a permitting backlog, which is especially true in the Portland area, uh, your typical two to three month waiting period before your installation can extend up to 12 months. I've even met a couple of people during the pandemic when there have been very large backlogs in the permitting system, uh, up to uh, over 12 months of a wait uh, between when you sign your contract and when you actually have your system installed. That's, I, I believe that that's getting better. However, there are still some backlogs specifically in the Portland area. Um, however, it's just waiting. There's nothing that you you have to do during that time and there's nobody doing work at your home. So 
nobody there to inconvenience you. When your contractor does get you scheduled on their uh, construction calendar, typically the installation for a residential system takes one, maybe two days of time. And so it's a pretty quick and easy process and does not uh, is not very disruptive. Uh, after the system is installed, your contractor is going to be managing those inspections, doing the interconnection and meter swap. That's going to take an additional couple of weeks. Uh, when the uh, they're ready to try on your system, they'll come back and flip the switch and uh, you'll have uh, clean renewable power being produced on your rooftop. And it feels great. So that is our webinar. I realize that uh, we're a little bit over the hour here, so I apologize for that. Uh, but we are going to jump into our uh, Q&A. Before I do that, I'm just going to throw up a quick poll which is our post-event survey. It tells us uh, how we're doing. Uh, so I greatly appreciate any of your feedback there. Uh, and I'm gonna leave that up for a few minutes as we go through the q and I just see one question uh, right now, but please feel free to uh, pour in any amount of questions you like, and I'll be happy to try to answer them. Uh, Joseph asks, what if I have an electrician friend that I'm working with and buy my solar hardware separately from a third party? Can I still qualify for all the incentives or am I forced to use and pay the costs of a general solar install company? That's a great question. Um, the uh, state rebate and the Energy Trust of Oregon incentives uh, will not apply if you try to self-install your system. Uh, the vast majority of folks uh, do not attempt self-installation. There's a lot to know about solar. Uh, the, there's a lot of electrical codes. Obviously, if you have an electrician friend, that can be really handy. Um, self-installation is possible, and there's some folks who do it. However, I, it's not something I can uh, really guide you on, and I'm not an expert on. Uh, however, uh, don't discount the value of a solar company. Uh, in terms of the federal incentive, um, I, I actually don't know. And again, I, I'm not a solar uh, tax professional. Uh, and so I, uh, I would defer uh, to a tax professional on that question. Uh, and I would suggest that you do as well. However, if you join us on uh, April 19th, I believe is our webinar uh, at noon, we're going to have our solar uh, tax incentive uh, special for Earth Day uh, week on that day. So please feel free to join us and ask that question again. And Elizabeth Krauss might be able to answer your question. I'm not seeing any other uh, questions in the Q&A. But I'm going to wait just for a second here to see if anybody is typing them in. Uh, however, uh, if not, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is something that I always enjoy delivering. Uh, I'm glad that um, uh, that you were able to join us today. Uh, and uh, please check out our future events uh, and join us tomorrow if you're in Northeast Portland for our showcase of a smart electric panel for your home. Not seeing any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and close out the webinar. Uh, thanks again. Have a great, have a great day.